Today, I'm making a gluten-free banana bread so delicious you'll never know what it's missing. And a decadent and dairy-free pecan milk panna cotta with caramelized pears. Later, my friend Jason comes over to share his secrets for living with a gluten intolerant child, coming up on Food for Thought. more and more of my friends and family have food allergies these days. As a passionate foodie, I always want to find ways to make food for people I love. So today, I'm going to get started on a family favorite recipe, but with a gluten-free twist. Gluten is a protein found in wheat products and more and more people are becoming intolerant to it. It's essentially a binder that creates the structure that you find in baked goods. So when you chew into a baguette and you see all those big bubbles and that amazing sort of elasticity, that is gluten working. And there are a couple of tricks in gluten-free baking that make it really easy and accessible to do today. Any quick bread is a great starter recipe into gluten-free baking. I'm taking my mom's banana bread and turning it into a gluten-free recipe. It works really well because of the texture of quick breads. It's a little bit denser and so something with gluten-free where you don't really get all of that elasticity in the large bubbles, muffins, quick breads, that kind of thing are perfect with gluten-free baking. So the first thing to my mom's banana bread is a little bit funny. I'm adding vinegar to milk. And the idea here is when you add vinegar to milk, it curdles the milk slightly. So what you end up getting are really rich, little dense milk curds and a little bit of a tang and it adds so much to the banana bread. So that is a holdover from my mom's recipe. Next, I'm going to combine all of my dry ingredients. And the start here is I have gluten-free flour. I have just a really generic kind of all-purpose gluten-free flour. There's a combination of fava bean flour, garbanzo bean flour, and a lot of other fun stuff that makes this a really good sort of all-purpose gluten-free flour. Once you have the combination of flours down, that's basically it. This is just my mom's banana bread recipe, so all I changed was I'm using gluten-free flour instead of regular flour. Great, and that's two cups. Gluten is something that is not only exclusive to wheat products. You can find gluten in all kinds of prepackaged foods all over the grocery store, so make sure to read your labels. Next, I'm going to add xanthan gum. And xanthan gum acts as a binder for any gluten-free flour, so you always need to have xanthan gum in a gluten-free recipe. Next, I'm going to add baking soda. And this gives a lift to the banana bread. And of course, a little bit of salt, because it adds a lot of great flavor. Now I'm gonna sift all of my ingredients together to make sure they're evenly distributed. So my dry ingredients are ready to go. I'm gonna get started with mashing up my bananas. There's a couple of techniques, a couple of schools of thought when it comes to banana smashing. You can do it with the back of a fork and a bowl, but my technique for smashing bananas is just taking the peeled bananas, sticking them in a freezer bag, and mushing it with my fingers. It's great, no cleanup and really easy. And I wanna end up with about three cups of mashed bananas. So that's about five whole bananas. The reason why I'm mushing bananas rather than just sticking them in a food processor or blender and blending them until they're a puree is I want those little clumps of banana. They add so much flavor when you slice it. Well, this looks sufficiently mashed to me, so these are ready to go. All of my ingredients are ready, so now I just have to stick it in the mixer and it's ready to bake. Now I'm gonna cream together my butter, sugar, and eggs. And this is super traditional baking. This is the base of almost any cake. First goes in my softened butter. And next, my sugar. And you just mix it until it's really nice and creamed together. You want a consistent texture, almost like you're making frosting. Okay, well, that looks great. So now that my butter and sugar are perfectly creamed together, I'm gonna add one egg at a time. That looks great. It's fully incorporated. So now the second egg. Well, that looks beautiful. It's really shiny and all one color. So now I'm gonna add my dry and wet ingredients, alternating back and forth. So I'm gonna start with my dry. So you wanna keep it on low and you don't wanna overbeat it because that'll create a denser bread. So now I'm gonna add a little bit of my wet. 
my curdled milk. The last bit of dry going in. And now the last of my milk. And we're good. So now I get to do all of my fun add-ins. I'm doing walnuts and chocolate chips because those are my classic favorites, but feel free to add any other kind of nuts or add-ins you like. So now I'm going to roughly chop my walnuts and I like to keep them in larger pieces because I like getting these little clusters of walnuts. Great, that seems fine. I just want to break down the whole walnuts in halves. So now I'm going to just add that to my mixer. And now I'm going to add my bananas. Great, I love it. My hands are not messy, it's a miracle. And next, I'm going to add my chocolate chips. And for a finishing touch, I'm gonna to add vanilla extract. I love the flavor of vanilla in anything baked, so I always add a little bit. So now I'm gonna pour my batter into a loaf pan, but I love making these into muffins for breakfast too, so you can use it in kind of any pan you like. Great, that looks beautiful. Now to stick it in the oven. It's been in for about 45 minutes at 350 degrees, and my banana bread is a beautiful golden brown. Now I'll set this aside to cool. So my banana bread is cooled, and the way I could tell it was done was the bounce back test. If you press into a baked good and it gives back, it's done. So I'm gonna have a taste of my bread, and I'm first gonna take it out of my loaf pan. Wow, look at that. And so now I'm gonna slice some of it up and enjoy it with some butter and honey. That just took it over the edge. That is so, so delicious. Oh my gosh. The great thing about this banana bread is I like to make it for my friends who are a little bit suspicious of gluten-free baking. I make it for them without telling them and they love it anyway. So it's a perfect starter for gluten-free baking. Next up, I'm making a dairy-free treat for my lactose intolerant friends that people who can eat dairy won't even miss it. A lot of my friends are lactose intolerant or are just trying to consume less dairy in general. So I've devised a really delicious dairy-free dessert with pecan milk. So it's really decadent, super simple, but so delicious. So the base of my panna cotta is a really rich pecan milk. And the fun thing here is if you just take away some of the sweetener and add a little more water, you have a great pecan milk that you can eat with cereal or add to your coffee in the morning. But for me, this is a dessert, so it's gonna be pumped up just a little bit. So I start with my pecans, and I just toss them straight into the blender. So the pecans are gonna be making the milk of this dish. And then my sugar. A little bit of cinnamon for flavor and just a hit of nutmeg, a little bit of vanilla extract, and now for a creamy factor, a little bit of coconut oil. This really kind of adds a nice sort of emulsified texture to it. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of water just to get it going. And now just a little bit of agave nectar. And agave is just a natural sweetener. It has a flavor almost like liquid brown sugar and maple syrup. It's quite sweet and has a really lovely round flavor to it. So that goes right in. And I like to mix in batches because it makes for a much smoother pecan milk. Great, so I'm just gonna let this blend and I'll pour in my water. looks beautiful, it's so frothy. I'm gonna have a taste just to see if I need to make any adjustments. Mm, that's really good. It's a little on the sweet side, but it's making up the core of my dessert, so I need it to be. Now I'm gonna strain my pecan milk just to get all of those pecan skins and other particles out of the way. I want it really smooth for my panna cotta. Well, I think I've strained it as much as I can. So I'm gonna take this to the back, simmer it for a little bit, and add a tiny bit of gelatin just to set it up.
So to turn my pecan milk into a panna cotta, I need to add gelatin. It gives it a really luxurious texture, really thick and kind of silky. So I'm just gonna whisk this in just to make sure that it's perfectly smooth. You don't want any gelatin clumps. Great, I think this is ready to put in some ramekins. My pecan milk has simmered. I'm now going to pour it into my little grease ramekins. Well, these look great. I'm gonna take them into my fridge and I'm gonna check on them in a couple of hours. So while my panna cotta is setting, I'm gonna get started on my caramelized pears and caramel pear sauce. The great thing about the caramelized pears is you can add them to any dessert and all of a sudden you have a really impressive dessert. And it's so simple to do as well. I'm gonna start by peeling, coring, and slicing up my pears. I'm now gonna transfer them to an oven safe baking dish. And pears give a lot of juice when you roast them, so that's gonna work really well to help caramelize them. And now I'm gonna sprinkle it with a little bit of sugar that I've put some vanilla bean into. So it's gonna give it a really beautiful vanilla flavor. As the pears roast, the sugar is gonna melt and caramelize down. It'll go so well with my panna cotta. And I mean, how easy is that? It's just sugar and pears. It's so simple and so delicious. I'll stick these in the oven for about an hour and in the meantime, get started on my last ingredient. So to make my dairy-free caramel sauce, I'm doing a dry caramel, which all that means is I'm putting sugar straight into the pot, heating it, and waiting until it starts to melt and caramelize all on its own. I'm gonna swirl it around just to make sure nothing gets burnt, and then I'm gonna add pear juice that has a lot of sugar in it already, so it's gonna create a really beautiful sauce. You can see it's starting to get a little bit wet. Nothing coloring is happening, but you can see it's starting to moisten and stick to the bottom of the pan. It's been three minutes and I think we're just about there. It's turning a really beautiful sort of deep caramel color. So now that it's fully liquefied, I'm going to add my pear juice and it's gonna splatter just a little bit, so be warned. I'm just gonna stir it and right now you'll see that the sugar has kind of hardened because the pear juice is not as hot as it is, but it'll basically go back into itself. You just have to stir it for a couple of minutes. So the caramel has dissolved back into the juice and I'm gonna let it reduce just a little bit. All reduction means is that some of the water is evaporating out of whatever I'm trying to reduce. So I'm trying to just thicken it a little bit. And it looks just about there, so I'm gonna turn off the heat and I'm gonna add my vanilla. I'd say about a teaspoon's fine. Well, this looks great. I'm gonna take it off and let it cool. So my pears are out of the oven and my panna cottas are set. So I'm gonna start putting this whole dish together. So first I'm gonna unmold my panna cotta. And all I'm gonna do, since these are already greased, is just run a butter knife right around the edge. Really clean. Flip a plate upside down, flip this, and cross my fingers. There we go. Perfectly set. Now all I have to do is put my other ingredients on it and it's ready to go. So I'm going to start with my pears. Perfect, and so now I'm gonna add a little bit of the caramel sauce just around the whole thing. So I'm gonna give it a try. That is so delicious, super rich, really creamy, very luxurious, and total proof that you can be dairy-free and still enjoy beautiful desserts. I have another allergy-friendly recipe coming up and a friend to walk me through the details of a gluten-free life, so stay tuned. Here today with my friend Jason, who's the chef at Osteria La Buca, a restaurant that is known for its handmade pastas and really amazing recipes. So thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. So tell me a little bit about how you work at Osteria La Buca. What goes into the recipes you create there? Well, we are a pasta and pizza forward restaurant, mm -hmm. and we are also looking for ulterior ways to make pastas without so much of the gluten forward. 
I noticed that because you make so many different pastas, going a gluten-free way must be kind of new and interesting. How do you approach doing gluten-free pasta? Uh, it was just a matter of looking back at the old world, mm -hmm. specifically Italy, or in that Mediterranean region where they use whole foods, the originals, the grains, the chickpeas, the flax seeds, rice, any one of those, and we wanted to go back to the roots. So we definitely took a leap of faith and started working on these old recipes and finding a way to appease all. Wow, that sounds fantastic. And I know that we're messing with one today, which I'm really excited about because it's my favorite thing on your menu. It is so good. Yes, we're today we're gonna do the nudie. Nudie meaning without. It's a pasta without a pasta. Huh. It's two ingredients and it's the easiest thing in the world to make. So you're saying this nudie, much to its title without, it's without gluten as well. But how would a normal nudie be? A normal nudie is always, well, mostly ricotta, mm -hmm. rolled in semolina flour. Okay. This today we're gonna use chickpea flour, okay. which will absorb the same way. Fantastic, so you're basically not losing anything. Nothing. I love it. So show me how to make this. Okay, so it's very simple. Great. It's two ingredients. You have your ricotta, mm -hmm. which you're gonna roll into these nice, large marble size ricotta balls. Great. And here you have your chickpea flour, mm -hmm. which can be found at most stores. Yeah. And it will almost 100% of the time have gluten-free written across the top. That is what you have to look for every single time, is gluten-free, mm -hmm. no other substitutes, no other way. We're gonna roll the balls mm -hmm. ever so gently and until you have just a bit. You take your container, lay a little bit more down, just like that, and you're gonna settle on top of there. Put a little bit more on top, these have to sit overnight in your refrigerator and that creates the skin on the outside of the ball. Okay, the non-pasta element. Right. So I'm gonna give it a try. Please. Okay. Well, we've made a couple of nudie. What happens next? So I'm gonna put a little bit more extra flour on here. Mm -hmm. We're gonna sprinkle it all around. We're gonna give it a nice little roll around so that they're nice and coated. Mm -hmm. You take this. We're gonna put it in the refrigerator, you're gonna hold it overnight, and you can have that tomorrow. Yum! But since we were gonna do this, I brought some from yesterday. Fantastic! And we'll cook those off and we'll try them in just a moment. Delicious, I can't wait to have those tomorrow night. Awesome. That looks amazing. Oh my goodness. You ready? I am so, are you kidding me? <laughs> it smells ridiculous in here. The sear is beautiful on this. It's just golden brown. And we're just gonna add a little bit there. <sighs> wow. A bit of butter, a little bit of fried rosemary. A little bit takes away from the bitterness. And a little bit of smoked prosciutto. Ooh, beautiful. And for the finale, we'll put a little bit of vincotto, which mm -hmm. translates into cooked wine of the style of balsamic. Delicious, wow. And for the ultimate finish, a touch of Sicilian olive oil. I can't believe how fancy this looks and it's so simple to make. Even your kids can make it. There's only a couple of ingredients, a couple steps. That's amazing, I love this. Okay, well let's get you a plate. Please. And when we get back, we'll give it a taste. My friend Jason is a chef at Osteria La Buca, a progressive restaurant with a variety of gluten-free options. He's just prepared for me one of his specialties, a gluten-free nudie that I cannot wait to taste. All right, well, let's dig in. Mm. Mm. This is so delicious. Still my favorite. What I love about it is it just proves that being gluten-free doesn't mean you have to give up anything whatsoever. This is a really rich, beautiful, decadent dish that I would never know whether it was gluten-free or not. So when you started doing gluten-free, I mean, how did you come to that? Why gluten-free? My son, uh, who's two years old, his name's Atticus. Through unfortunate events, we come to find that he was allergic to gluten products after our fifth visit to our dermatologist. Wow. 
And how did you find out he was allergic? I mean, did he just have a bad reaction to it? He had extremely bad rashes and sores, so much to the fact that he would bleed. Oh my gosh. And so we stripped his entire diet down mm -hmm. to nothing and brought him back up. And what we found was that he was allergic to gluten, which essentially makes me gluten-free, except for when I'm in the restaurant. Well, wow. so I mean, as a chef that specializes in amazing pasta and pizza, was that a kind of a world-changing yeah. moment was, to be my son can't eat pasta? It, it was a little challenging, but yeah. um, you know, we definitely look for the challenge, and uh, it, it has been a great thing, and it's opened up my eyes to a whole other world of food. So, for any families who have just discovered they have an gluten intolerance, do you have any advice? Don't panic. Uh, definitely listen to what your doctor has to say first of all. As far as labels are concerned, definitely look for the gluten-free, because if it doesn't say gluten-free, it's probably not. Mm -hmm. No matter if they says natural, organic, whatever it is, it has to say gluten-free. Well, thank you so much, Jason. The food was delicious, and I love this new recipe. Hey, anything I can do to educate. Thank you, and I've learned so much about food allergies, and the big bottom line here is just because you have a food allergy doesn't mean you can't eat delicious food. See you again for another episode of Food for Thought next week. Closed captioning and other promotional consideration is provided by